Good evening. I'm really happy to see you all here. It's our very first Medicine in Our Backyard program for this season, which is, and it is presented, as I think you all know, by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. My name's Dorothy Larson. I'm the immediate past chair of the foundation. Um, and I just have a couple of housekeeping details that are actually extremely important points of interest. We want to thank our sponsors for this program, Mike and Polly Smith, and also UCI, which has been a wonderful partner in doing this program, bringing their extraordinary doctors. And I'm, I know most of you are repeat attendees. We appreciate it, and I'm sure you appreciate the level of the physicians that we have at these programs. It's really remarkable. And I'll get into introducing tonight's in just a second. Um, the series continues through May, and our next one, I don't really like the title of. I think it should be called Healthy Aging, but the full title is Frailty and Healthy Aging. <laughs> I think we should come and listen to that and find out how to avoid the frailty part. Um, and we also, on our Library Live series, I don't know if you attend those, they're fabulous, and we've got a wonderful lineup this year. Um, on October 25th, Dr. Serge Dedina will be here, and he is the surfing mayor of, uh, oh now, Imperial Beach, down in San Diego. And he's an environmentalist, and he's gonna be really interesting. So just a note about the foundation. I think you know that many of the programs that are here at the library, and many of the enhancements, like the Media Center and the carpet, and and chairs you're enjoying here, are provided through the foundation. And it is a membership organization, so that's kind of how we do all of this. We urge you to become a member if you aren't already. Um, and really the foundation does exist because of generous donors and sponsors, like I said, like Mike and Polly Smith, and supporters like you. That sounds like something I hear on NPR often. <laughs> so. The speaker that we have this evening, I'm really excited to introduce, Dr. Sanjay, I'm gonna do it right, Kedar. <laughs> um, he's a board certified ophthalmologist specializing in the medical and surgical management of patients with uveitis and other automo autoimmune and infectious eye diseases. The thing I think is most interesting, well, two things really, he takes a really holistic approach to medicine, which I think is more in the forefront of people's minds now and is really important because, as you can tell from the topic tonight, the, um, the, potential, the role of the gut, bi gut microbiome in UV uveitis and age-related macular degeneration. Well, if you think about that, it sounded like kind of an oxymoron in a sentence to me at first. What role does the gut biome have on our eyes? Or what effect? And that's one of the things that he is very involved in the research of. So <clears throat> that's one of the things I think is really exciting. And the other, because I think it's important to know these kinds of things, he travels annually, I believe, to places like Nepal to provide medical services that would not otherwise be available to the people there. And I just think that's really cool. So with that, I give you Dr. Sanjay Kedar. So, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction and also the invitation to speak today. Um, I, just as an aside, and I was telling Dorothy earlier today, but I've spent an inordinate amount of time at this library. Uh, I spent in the children's area with my kids, and actually the grant for the research that I'm doing today was written upstairs. So uh, I, I'm very uh, pleased to be here and to be speaking to all of you. Um, just in general, as a roadmap for the talk, um, it probably may not take the whole time. Uh, I do. I'm totally open to answering questions that you might have about uh, eyes, the microbiome, my research, or any other questions that you might have, okay? Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. There we go. There we go. Perfect. 
All right, so uh, I thought I'd start with uh, something a little dismal. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so, I really like Orson Welles, that's who that is. Um, but, you know, and he is a great director and an actor, but he was mistaken, right? So, you know, he says we live alone, or we're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Um, and the truth is that we're never alone, right? So even when we think we're alone, we're not alone. And the reason for that is we're all a symbiotic organisms. So whatever you think of as yourself, you actually have 10 times as many other cells that are not you residing in your body. And so those things are always with you. And, and those organisms actually have a great role to play in terms of your health and your behavior, believe it or not. So uh, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but these organisms really influence uh, your, your life. And so, you know, again, you should never, you're never alone, OK? Uh, so briefly. We're going to talk about, I'll define the microbiome and we'll talk about how it's studied a little bit. We'll also discuss how that microbiome plays into your health. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about, not a little bit, we'll talk about uh, how the microbiome may influence eye disease. That's sort of hopefully why you guys are here. But uh, I do think the microbiome by itself is interesting enough to have its own lecture. So again, there are two terms that I'll bring up when we talk about the microbiome. One is microbiome. So that includes all the microbes that are in your body as well as the genetic material. So all of these organisms, all of these bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, they all have genes. And those genes are producing proteins all the time. And those proteins are then influencing what happens in your body. Microbiota is another term that I may use interchangeably, and that really refers to the community of organisms that's in your body, okay? So for most of human history, we consider ourselves, we've been at war with these germs and at war with organisms, right? And so this is popularized in many of the books. I'm sure you can find them outside. Um, but especially with gun germs, guns, germs, and steel, right? We've, we've been looking at uh, how disease, things like smallpox or yellow fever, how those influence the rise and the fall of different civilizations and why some people uh, gained prominence and others sort of fell by the wayside. Um, but, you know, we have, besides these historic agents of change, we also have more modern infections, right? HIV, AIDS, hepatitis. Um, and all of these things uh, really are, we, we've always thought about microbes and bacteria and viruses as something that we need to fight, right? This is where modern microbiology came, from, came about. This is where uh, pharmac you know, pharmaceuticals came about. All of this was to fight these organisms. But the way that we see these things is changing, right? So we used to think that we have some bacteria in our body, there's a few that are causing problems, and then there's a number of other ones that are just there. They're bystanders. Well, what we're realizing now is that those organisms that we thought were just bystanders are actually doing a lot for our, our body. And so the way that I want you guys to think about the microbiome is think about us as an ecosystem. Right? So rather than fighting, we're working together. There's a symbiosis there. And so just like this is what we, most of you or most of us here on the coast think about when we think about an ecosystem, um, but each part has its role to play. And if you throw that ecosystem out of balance, which is something that we've been very concerned about as uh, physicians and as we understand these processes better, you're going to induce either health or disease. So I alluded to this earlier, but um, what you should understand about the microbiome is this, is that uh, the cells generally outnumber your own cells by 10 times, okay? The, what's more impressive is that their genetic material outnumbers ours by 100 to 1. So you can imagine that, and most of these cells are important in daily processes, right? So uh, they're important for vitamin production. So many of you have heard of vitamin B12. That's produced only by the bacteria in your gut. You don't get that from anything else. And nothing else can produce it. 
Uh, vitamin K, which is another vitamin that helps with uh, prevent bleeding. That's also uh, a product of your gut microbiome. Your ability to eat and digest vegetables, largely the microbiome. So largely those gut bacteria are what, what are doing that. Without that and without a healthy microbiome, you wouldn't be able to do any of these things. And lastly, a healthy gut microbiome offers a defense against bacteria. So if you don't have all these bacteria that are there in your gut or in your mouth, your eyes, um, those bacteria, then other opportunistic bacteria can take hold. And those bacteria can then cause infections. And that's what we find happens in some conditions where we wipe out our normal bacteria and then we have uh, bacteria that are pathogenic or that cause disease take their place. Oh, I swear, there's one more thing, um, which is just this last is there a laser pointer here. No. Um, so just on this, on the bottom here, one thing to note is that if you look at human cells, human to human, we're 99.9 percent .9 alike in terms of our genetic material. But if you compare the gut microbiome, or if you compare the bacteria and the genetic material in your gut to the person sitting next to you, you'll find that it's 80 to 90 percent different. And there are, in fact, bacteria that only exist in you, not in anybody else, not anywhere else, but specifically in you. So you are really unique, all of you guys. Um, so what happens? How do we get this microbiome? How, does, how do we get these bacteria in our gut? Well, uh, we're, the thought right now is that we're actually born, newborns are sterile. Not, not that they can't have kids, but they're, they're sterile and that there are no bacteria, right? Um, there's no viruses. And that they actually receive this first inoculum, this first bit of bacteria that then colonizes their body from the mother as they pass through the birth canal, as from the, from the vaginal bacteria. They then also will get some of that bacteria from the breast milk. And as they get this bacteria, it starts to coat all of their surfaces, their mouth, their gut, their eyes, skin. What's interesting is that it doesn't stop, it doesn't stop there. So they get col the babies get colonized, but that microbiome in these different regions of the body is dynamic. So it doesn't just stay static. They don't just get this inoculum bacteria and that's the way you are for the rest of your life. But it changes and it's dynamic over the first three years of life. And usually by around three, that's when it changes. Okay? Or it sort of settles in. The other thing that induces this settling in of the microbiome is when you stop breastfeeding. So what they found is that as soon as you stop breastfeeding, the microbiome actually shifts more towards an adult microbiome. Okay, so it's more, it's more kind of stable and developed. The last thing I'll say is, uh, in, we used to think, and I did mention this, that the newborns, it's ster they're sterile. But the truth is that there is some bacteria in the placenta, and the placenta itself has its own microbiome. What's interesting is that that microbiome is very closely related to the microbiome in the mouth of the mother. So we think that maybe what, what's happening is the bacteria from the mouth are then going through the blood to the placenta. And this probably explains why pregnant women, when they have periodontal disease or gum disease, they can actually induce preterm labor from that. And so it may be an alteration that's going on with those bacteria that are then inducing labor at that point. So, when newborns have this bacteria and this microbiome, what it's doing is it's actually teaching the baby's immune system. What's, what is the baby, what's self, and what's not self. So, you know, all I really needed to learn in kindergarten, all you really needed to know for your immune system, you learn when you're a year old or two years old, okay? And what we found is that babies that are, ra that are, are delivered by C-section, they have an increased risk for autoimmune diseases later in life. And so what we think happens is that their microbiome may not be colonized by the particular bacteria that will prevent these autoimmune diseases from occurring later in life, all right? Uh, 
Another, I think, very fascinating aspect about this is that the bacteria is different depending on where you are in the human body. The bacteria is different. So what you see are these sort of clock looking uh, things. They basically, these pie charts uh, are to describe the relative proportions of different bacteria. And so you can see that they're all different no matter, depending on where you are in the human body. And what's even more fascinating is that it's site specific. So your right hand, if you're right handed, your right hand is different microbiome than your left hand. In your mouth, your microbiome is different on the right side of your mouth than the left side of your mouth. So you can tell where the cultures were taken, if you take cultures and look at the bacteria from someone's mouth, you can tell based on the, the pattern of bacteria that are there. And what's interesting is that these things don't, these environments are relatively well delineated. So the bacteria that are in your mouth, there's a line where it stops and then the bacteria changes when it gets into your throat and then another line where it changes when it gets into your stomach. And so even, even within your mouth, the bacteria on your tongue and on the roof of your mouth are different than the teeth where they come into contact every day. So there's a lot that we don't know about how these microbiomes work and how these bacteria take hold and why they take hold in certain places. But we can see that there's a huge diversity of these bacteria and that there obviously is some specific purpose for them being in these areas because they are so different, even right next to each other. So how do we analyze the microbiome? So the reason that the microbiome, the Human Microbiome Project, which is run by the NIH, it's like a $150 million project, uh, started in 2007. So that's relatively recent. And actually, we've known that there are bacteria living on us since, I think, the 1600s, which is when Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, who invented the, the light microscope, when he first got the microscope, the way that he, the first thing he looked at was he took some you know, scrapings off of his teeth, put it in water, and then looked at it under the microscope. And he saw all these things floating around. He called them animalcules. And he said, it's an amazing. It's like the water is alive. And so we've known that there are these bacteria on us for hundreds of years, and yet only in 2007 did we really start analyzing this. And the reason for that is because many of the bacteria or organisms that we would normally try to culture, right, we'll take a cotton swab and then take it to the lab and see what grows, and that way we'd know what was there. Well, a lot of these bacteria are, they grow slowly, they don't grow well in culture, and we can't identify them. But more recently, we've had an ability to analyze DNA, right? And so what we can look at is DNA and also RNA, ribonucleic acid. This is called, this is a ribosome. So this is a very simple cartoon of the part of a cell that produces proteins, okay? And this is, this is, this occurs in all cells. However, in bacteria cells, there is a very specific, uh, protein called 16S rRNA. So you'll see that at the bottom there, okay? So it's part of this machinery that produces proteins. That 16S rRNA is well preserved through and found in every single bacteria. What's interesting is that it has some variability. So when we sequence it, when we look and see, okay, which, you know, what is the sequence of this um, nucleic acid? we can actually look and see that there are differences between, say, a Staphylococcus bacteria and a Streptococcus bacteria. What's even more interesting is that the further the variability increases, the longer that those organisms, the, the farther those organisms were from splitting off. So all, all, orga, all cells kind of came from a single cell initially, and then they, as evolution occurred, they kind of kept splitting, and they got farther and farther along the, the sort of the evolutionary tree. Well, the closer they are in the evolutionary tree, the more preserved this uh, 16S rRNA is, and the further along, there's more variability. So you can then imagine that according to the differences in sequencing this, you can then identify which bacteria are come from which species, okay? So this is, uh, 
borrowed, this is, a, this is an idea borrowed from Claire Frazier, who's over at University of Maryland and who's done a lot of microbiome work. But essentially, this is like a barcode. All right. This is the sequence here, and you see the, the V regions are the variable areas where it's variable. And you can imagine if you take this and you sequence and you have a number of different um, patterns, you can group the ones that look similar and separate out the ones that are different. And when we're looking at someone's microbiome, what we're doing is we're taking a sample, we're taking that um, sequence and amplifying it, and then we're looking at it on a, on a computer. So you have sort of big data and we're looking at, this is a lot of information. This takes data scientists to actually analyze this. And then we can identify the species and we can take all of those barcodes and we can say, well, I have four of this type of barcode and six of that type and eight of another. And you can see what the relative abundance of these bacteria are, okay? And that gives us a pattern. And so you can look at the pattern in you, for instance, and that pattern would be different from the pattern in you. All right. And then what we can do is we can then look back and analyze that and take more of a history on health and say, okay, well, this people that are very healthy have this pattern and people that are less healthy have another pattern. And as we get more and more patients and we analyze that, we'll, uh, we will soon be able to have an idea of what is a healthy microbiome. We don't know for sure at this point. So this is a, uh, this is a picture of a group of, um, uh, of indigenous people in Venezuela. These are the Yanomami people. And they actually have the most diverse microbiome in the world that we've been able to sequence. And they have relatively little to no contact with Western civilization. And their diets are their hunter-gatherer society. They don't, they don't use vaccines generally, antibiotics, Western medicines. Um, and generally, their health is pretty good. So what influences, what influences different um, your microbiome? Right? So what influences bacteria in you to, uh, uh, to flourish versus in other people, they kind of die off? And that... There's a number of different things, including your, what you eat, which makes sense, um, your culture, your location, so where you are, um, who else is in your household. So what we found is that actually if you take a family that's living together, all of their microbiomes are fairly similar, even if they eat differently. If you have a pet, that pet's microbiome gets included in yours as well. Um, and so there are a lot of different things that can uh, influence that. Uh, and that's also part, and it's also dynamic. So we found that if you eat something different, within three days, your microbiome can change. So that's, that's a positive thing, I think, in terms of uh, dealing with, with the microbiome and that there seems to be a way that we can change this and change it fairly quickly. So what makes, the micro, what makes these microbes go bad, right? Um, and we, we, don't, we don't know for sure um, why, why that would happen and why they would, uh, you know, why they then create more unhealthy uh, individuals if, as, these, as the microbiome's changing, but that's exactly what we're trying to study. So one interesting thing, um, you know, I, so I, I don't know if you guys, I'm maybe not communicating effectively. I think this stuff is fascinating because it's just, there's, um, you know, it's a whole nother, it's like a whole world that we don't know anything about. And when you start comparing and putting patterns together, you know, again, we always, it's, it's amazing that, uh, these, that these kind of, dis as Dorothy was saying, these things that you would think are totally disparate and they should have nothing to do with each other. And yet, here we are. So if you look at, this is part of what's called the hygiene hypothesis of autoimmune disease, okay? So autoimmune disease, again, your body is attacking itself, your immune system is attacking itself. So if you look at these graphs, right, they're sort of, it's interesting, if you, especially if you look down here. So helminths are parasitic worms, right? Yeah, worms. So if you look at this map, you can see that autoimmune diseases are very high in areas where there's a low incidence of parasitic worms. 
And part of the thought is that these worms may help to induce an inflammatory reaction or induce or train your immune system so that it's more tolerant, so it doesn't attack your, yourself. And there was actually, I don't know if any of you listened to, there's a podcast called Radio Lab that, uh, yeah. So Radio Lab, they had, a, they had a person, I think that he had very bad asthma and he traveled to like Sudan or somewhere in Africa and he basically just walked through poop most of the, for like a week or two. And then he said after, and he, and he infected himself with these worms and then after that, like his asthma was gone. He was treated well. So there probably is something to this. But the question then becomes, is it due to these worms? Is it due to something else? And I actually think that part of it now, as we learn more about this microbiome, part of it's going to be that this autoimmune incidence may be higher because the microbiome is changing, and it's changing generationally. Remember that your microbiome comes from your mother. So if your mother, you know, the way that we practice medicine now or that we've practiced for the last 50 to 100 years, if we're giving you antibiotics all the time, and that's wiping out certain populations, and then that mother then has a child, and the child never gets some of those bacteria from the mother, well, that child's not gonna be able to pass it on to their children, right? So generationally, what happens is we lose some parts of the microbiome. And again, this is a hypothesis, this is a theory. I, we don't have strong evidence for it one way or another, but these are all interesting questions to ask with regards to sort of this whole new area of, of research. All right. So the other thing that I will uh, bring up here is, all, again, these are the sort of clocks that talk about distribution of different types of bacteria. And what you'll see is that as people get older, their bacteria, their microbiome changes. The proportion of different bacteria changes over time. Um, and one thought, and there are different things that occur that may influence how that happens, right? So again, if you're a toddler and you get antibiotic treatment, that changes it. If you're malnourished, that changes it versus if you're healthy. Um, if you're a baby and you're breastfed versus formula fed or solid foods, the microbiome changes. And again, this is all pertaining to the gut. Um, and then as you're an adult, obese patients have a different microbiome than, uh, than patients that are, are not obese or, or normal weight. Uh, and as you're elderly, this increases. And I always think this is funny because the, the, the elderly that they've described in this chart is 65 to 80, which is sort of what we... <laughs> what we sort of think about, but actually if you do any, if you're involved in research, and I always found this out maybe in the last five years, that if you're, um, the, the Human Microbiome Project was 18 to 45. So if you're over 45, you're actually considered elderly for, for research purposes. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is that there, there is this shift as people get older in their bacteria, and one of the thoughts is that the bacteria themselves shift to becoming more pathogenic or more virulent. And it may be an evolutionary thing where they actually induce the death of their host. And these are people that are, so that they can then spread further. Um, so the next question, the next uh, aspect that I wanted to introduce to you is what are we gonna do about this? So what, what, once we have, we know what the microbiome is, let's say we figure out uh, what is healthy, what's not healthy, what are some things that we can do? And there are actually these sort of microbiome-based applications for things that we can do now. One of those things is a fecal transplantation, which sounds terrible. And actually, most patients, it, we're trying to figure out a different thing to call it and a different way to... Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's, if uh, any of you are in marketing, this is a branding opportunity, you know, <laughs> right here. And um, so we have, the, we have a healthy gut, right? And we take a stool sample, those things are purified or liquefied, thrown in a blender, and then through a colonoscopy, so we, the doctor can actually then insert that directly into the colon for patients. And what they found is that when we there is something called C. diff. Has everyone heard of that or, you know, or had it? Um, but C. diff is a very deadly infection, and it causes a lot of diarrhea and dehydration. It's, it's really the bane of existence for hospitals because in, hospital, it, in hospitals, they're giving people large quantities of antibiotics. You're eradicating these, um, 
these bacteria and these microbes. And that's then causing uh, this C. diff to, uh, to proliferate within the gut. And then that causes diarrhea and dehydration and people can die. So one thought is that this is occurring because the microbiome is, um, is decreased, right? The diversity is decreased. There's not as much bacteria defending you against this C. diff. So why not take a fecal transplant? Does it work? There's a 90% success rate with this, okay? In the past, and this, this, in the past, like I'm not that old, but when I started in med school, we didn't have this. We, if you were C. diff, you were treating patients with the harshest antibiotics you could to try to eradicate the C. diff after you had already put the patient on weeks of antibiotics beforehand. Now we have this, and does anyone want to take a guess how long this takes to work? Oh, you guys are optimists. It's two weeks. So, but it's still, for, for, for medical therapies, two weeks is a very impressive amount of time for something to work, especially for something as threatening as this. Right. Yeah, so I think in the studies that they, they sorry, I, I just want to make sure it's for the recording purposes you want the, the mic. It doesn't matter. Okay. So um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, the, can you ask me the question one more time, please? You said one transplant. One transplant. Yeah. So uh, what they found is actually probably about, uh, let's see, 420. So probably about five, 20%, less than 20% may not do well with the first transplant. If you do a second one, all, almost all of them will have a success rate. There. Yes. No, there are certain areas that are doing I think it's becoming more widely accepted now. Um, I, previously, I was uh, in practice in New York, and at that time, only Mount Sinai was doing it. But um, they've, they've started to do it at a number of places. And I've actually run into a number of gastroenterologists that are doing it even in private practice. So I think that this is definitely. Yes. Yeah. So, there, yeah, so that's, that, was, that was another part. But again, I think that um, it's a. You know, a lot of these therapies are what patients are willing to willing to take, uh, and so some patients are not. You know, that's still it's still an unappealing sort of thing to. You know, you're taught not to do it from when you're a very young kid, right? So, when the doctor asks you to do it later, it's it's not always so good. Um, but anyway, this is a very interesting application for the microbiome, and probably will apply not just to C. diff but to other things uh, later on. How about cancer? So this, all, this was a very interesting, and I talked to a few of my colleagues at Sloan Kettering and some at MD Anderson in Texas, and these are, this is what they're finding is very, is very interesting. And this is that um, immunotherapy, so everyone's heard about immunotherapy for melanoma, you're, you're training the immune system to, to fight off the cancer. And what they found was that certain people were doing better with immunotherapy than others. And they were trying to figure out why this might be. And when they looked at their microbiomes, they found that people that had the more diverse microbiome actually did much better than people that had a very narrow microbiome or not a lot of different types of bacteria. The other thing is that some of these therapies, you know, remember that bacteria that are in your gut, if you're taking any kind of medications, the, a lot of the processing of that medication goes through your gut. So if you don't have the ability to process certain drugs, then you might not actually gain the benefit. Um, the second thing is people that develop graft versus host disease. So there are some people that have, um, that need stem cell transplants. And what happens is over time, that stem cell, those stem cells then start attacking the host, okay? Um, again, they found that if they have a narrow microbiome, they're more likely to get graft versus host disease. And if they have a more diverse one, they almost never, never developed it. And lastly, what, they, what they're looking at is people that get chemotherapy, well, chemotherapy doesn't treat just your cells. It wipes out a lot of those bacterial cells also. And so it takes a long time for people to recover having had sort of intensive chemotherapy. Um, what they're trying to do now is actually bank your microbiome. So they'll actually take it from you before you start chemotherapy, give you chemotherapy, and then put it back. So it sort of tries to restore where you were before the chemotherapy occurred, All right? 
All right, so I'm uh, going to now branch into the I portion of it. Does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Please. Uh, probiotics, would that help? Yeah, so the question is whether probiotics would help. And the truth is that we don't know. And we're, we've done some studies. The studies have not really been that promising. And I don't know if any of you read the news recently. There was a fairly large um, meta-analysis looking at studies didn't seem to find any benefit to probiotics. But I think part of that is because we're not, the studies are not always designed well to look for those differences. You need a large number of patients to do that. Um, there's also probably a better, there's more benefit to something called prebiotics. So probiotics are you, you're basically swallowing bacteria and hoping that they colonize your gut and that they then have beneficial effects. But there's also prebiotics, which are which is basically like feed, it's it's like fertilizer, right? So you're you're basically giving the correct food to grow the right bacteria, and that probably is going to show more promise. Specifically, and you know, this question always comes up, but it may come up is like, well, what do I eat to to give me a healthier microbiome? We don't know, but the best, the most promising thing that we can see is fiber. Lots and lots of fiber, way more than you would think that you would eat at a normal Western diet. It's something like 35 to 50 grams a day, which is, if you try to look at it, it's actually quite a bit. Um, but they have found that those, that fiber gets converted by the bacteria to something called a short chain fatty acid, which is anti-inflammatory. Right? Is fiber Yes, that's, it's considered, yeah, exactly. So this is the patient that um, I wanted to show you guys that got me interested in, in the microbiome and how it relates to eye disease. So this is, was an 80-year-old woman who developed a disease called scleritis or necrotizing scleritis. And what that is is an inflammation of the white wall of the eye. Necrosis or it means death. And necrotizing, what it does is it starts to erode or eat away at the wall of the eye. If this goes unchecked, the eye goes in the bucket. You lose it because there's a hole in the eye and there's nothing else you can do for that. So we end up treating these patients very aggressively with lots of steroids, so anti-inflammatories and systemic medications, and eventually putting them on chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is pretty harsh, but the idea is we're going to you know, take a hammer to their immune system so that it doesn't continue to attack the eye and they don't lose vision. Well. This is an 80-year-old woman, the loveliest 80-year-old woman you've ever seen, very nice. And you know, I hated to do that to her, but I needed to do something to save the eyes. So we gave her all this chemotherapy. Well, she wound up in the hospital probably about two months later with sepsis from a urinary tract infection. So I got a call from the emergency room, and they said, hey, well, what should we do? I said, well, you have to take her off the chemotherapy, obviously, because she needs to be able to fight the infection. And they didn't know what the infection was, but she was very sick. So they gave her very broad spectrum, strong antibiotics, right? IV, she was in the hospital for a week. She did well got, uh, with the infection and came out. And I said, okay, she came to see me about a week after she got out of the hospital. And I said, well, what are we going to do? You know, she said, do, do I need to go back on those medications? I really don't want to do it. Is there anything else that we can do? And I said, look, well, let's right now, after we'd taken her off these medications, and the chemotherapy worked very well, but at the moment when I'd had seen her after this um, visit to the hospital, she had no inflammation in the eye. Everything looked just as it did when she was on the chemotherapy. So I said, well, let's wait and see. Let's see what happens. If it starts to look like it's activating again, we'll put you back on the chemotherapy. She wasn't that excited about it, but she knew she needed to, if, to save her eye. Well, a month went by, nothing happened. Three months went by, nothing happened. A year went by, no recurrence, okay? And this is someone that took a long time to get under control. So I had no idea why treating her with antibiotics should have resulted in what we, what we conceive or perceive as an immune disease, why that would work. And so then I started doing a little bit more research and that's where we started to look at you know, is, is, is something going on in the gut that might then be influencing the eye. So there's actually influence for autoimmune disease in humans that the, micro, the microbiome has an influence there. 
And there are several models, both animal models and analysis in human beings. And we look at, uh, there's central nervous system inflammation, so multiple sclerosis, right, is an inflammatory disease of the brain. And when we look at patients with multiple sclerosis, we see that they have a different microbiome than healthy individuals. And if we take the microbiome, so if we take a fecal transplant from a person with MS, so we can't uh, ethically then transplant it to a healthy individual and see whether they get MS, right? So, um, so we use mice. And they said, okay, well, what if we transplant it into a mouse? What happens? The mouse gets MS, right? So it's interesting that, and then what we did with the mice, we said, well, with these mice that have this microbiome that is more likely to give them MS, what happens if we give them antibiotics? Well, the inflammation, they get almost no inflammation in the central nervous system, right? So something's going on, right? There's, a, there's, there's definitely a, this transfer of bacteria is resulting in inflammation, and if we eliminate those bacteria, the inflammation doesn't occur. There's also rheumatoid arthritis, right? So most of you will either, someone here probably has rheumatoid arthritis or knows someone with rheumatoid arthritis. But a similar thing occurs. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis also have a different um, microbiome than healthy individuals. And um, what we can, and similarly in mouse models, they've given them antibiotics and that actually eliminates or decreases the inflammation. So, yeah, so this is more of, more of the same. And the last, the last sort of thing I'll discuss here is, is something called ankylosing spondylitis. And this has the most relation to the eyes. So ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammation of the lower spine. Patient, most of the patients that have this have a gene called HLA-B27. And that gene, if we test these patients, we'll find that most of them are positive. The gene predisposes you to inflammation, both of the lower spine as well as of the eyes. Okay, you get a similar sort of um, appearance. And so when we've looked at those patients, we again, we find a similar thing. There's different bacteria that are occurring that are different than what we find in healthy individuals. And <clears throat> one other theory with this is that, well, how, why, what, how does the gene play into this? Well, what they found is that patients with this gene, it may actually cause a leaky gut syndrome. Right, so it actually causes, it opens up some of the channels in the gut that then allow bacteria to go through the bloodstream. And they think maybe either it, those bacteria then wind up in the eye and the, the immune system attacks it, or it creates an inflammation, uh, inflammatory state in the body that then causes this, um, the eye to be attacked. Another thought is that there's a cross reactivity. So we say, okay, well, they're exposed to certain types of bacteria in the gut that look very similar to proteins that are in the eye. And so you have this, it's almost like a mistaken identity, all right? So this was, sorry for the, the scientific nomenclature, but uh, the point of this was that the, it's not as simple as good and bad bacteria. Okay, so it's not as simple as saying, let's take these bacteria out, let's give you some of these good ones that we see in healthy individuals and everything will get better. There are some bacteria that promote, um, promote inflammation. So Th17 cells are, are T cells. Those are the effector cells in your immune system. And the specific subtype of 17 is one that's associated with a lot of autoimmune diseases and also with immune diseases of the eye. And so this type of bacteria seems to increase that, uh, the, those cells within the body. So it leads to what we think is a pro-inflammatory state. There are other types of bacteria, specifically Clostridia and Bacteroides, that seem to enhance differentiation of regulatory cells. So these are the cells that when your immune system gets ramped up, these cells come in and kind of tamp it down. There's always this cycle. You don't want, when you have an inflammatory response, you don't want it sort of running away like a, like a freight train you want it eventually to come to a stop so that it doesn't cause any further damage. Well, those regulatory cells are the ones that do that. And in fact, when you look at back to those, that MS, the MS patients, they actually had a, um, and they actually had an increase in, or a decrease in Clostridia species, right? 
So you can imagine where those patients, they have a decrease in specific species that promotes regulation of the immune system, that they wind up with an immune response that runs away from them and that starts attacking themselves. So one of the areas, uh, Dorothy mentioned, uh, one of the areas of my interest is, is uveitis. So uveitis is inflammation inside the eye. So uvea means grape, and that was what the Greek, is, I think it's Greek, what they thought the inside of the eye looked like, and so then they called it uveitis. And uveitis is probably a group of about 50 to 60 different diseases that all kind of look the same. So you know how when you go to the doctor and you say, oh, my throat's red? Well, is it strep? Is it a virus? We don't know. It all looks the same. You can test for it and see. Well, the same thing happens with uveitis is that uh, much of uveitis looks the same. Much of how the inflammation occurs or um, affects the eye causes a similar appearance. But there are many different diseases, so we have to do blood work and look for other things that may be causing it. And in about 50% of those patients, we never find anything. So it's a huge mystery as to what's causing the disease in those other 50% of patients. Uveitis can cause blindness. It's probably the third leading cause of blindness in developed countries probably behind diabetes and glaucoma, I believe. So it's, it's important, and it tends to disproportionately affect younger patients who are in the prime of their life and they're working. So the cost of uveitis is fairly high because this is taking people away from work, they have doctor's visits, and if they go blind, then they're not able to work further. So in that sense, for eye disease, it's an important Although it's a relatively rare condition, it probably occurs in about one out of every 10,000 patients, it's significant enough uh, and its impact is significant that it warrants study. So again, if you, you may or may not be able to see with the lights on, but uh, you can see these sort of yellowish nodules on the iris, on the colored part of the eye. Those are actually collections of inflammatory cells. And this is from a patient that has a disease called sarcoidosis, which is an immune disease that affects typically the lungs first and then the eyes. Um, but the point of this slide is just that, again, there are a lot of different diseases. They all probably have a common pathway. This alphabet soup over here on the right is, are names of all the different signals that your body sends to uh, promote inflammation. Okay. And we found that all those pathways are fairly similar. No matter how the uveitis starts, they're all fairly similar. I told you that we can't ethically experiment on, on humans for a lot of these things. And so we have mouse models. So EAU is a model for its experimental autoimmune uveitis. So in these, in these mice, you give them an injection of a little bit of bacterial protein, and then they develop inflammation in their eyes. And what we see up here on the, on the right, uh, or sorry, on the left, is actually a picture of the retina, which is the thin tissue inside the eye that, uh, that is, is an extension of the brain, but it actually receives all the, all the signals and processes the images. And all that red that's there on the left-hand side is our inflammatory cells. So this is what it naturally or normally looks like. Well, when we took these mice and we injected or gave them broad spectrum antibiotics, just like we did for all the other ones, that's what happened, the retina. There's very few inflammatory cells, okay? So again, there's, there's a lot of strong um, evidence that the gut plays a role for uveitis, for inflammation in the eye. And similarly, when we take the mi microbes or the bacteria from those mice, and you put it into mice that are raised in a germ-free environment, so they have no bacteria in them at all, those mice develop uveitis. So how do we think this happens? And again, I, I alluded to this earlier, but when we've looked at mouse models of uveitis, we can actually see that a bacterial protein is necessary for uh, the activation of inflammatory cells or T cells that attack the eye. So what they did was they looked and they said, okay, well, if we raise them in a germ-free environment, they don't have any bacteria, do they develop uveitis? No. And in fact, the cells that, attack, that you would think would attack the eye are not activated. They're, they're, they lie dormant. 
when we, um, the other thing that we noticed was that these cells, we're, we were seeing cells that were going from the gut, so you can actually tag the cells with um, sort of uh, markers, molecular markers, and see where they go in the body. And what we were noticing was that the cells that were um, occurring or being activated in the gut were actually migrating to the eye. So we know that there's this direct correlation between the two. Does anyone know what this is? So I'll move on from BVS. Yeah, so retina, absolutely. So this is macular degeneration. So this is probably something more of you have heard of and more of you are familiar with. And the question I always had was, well, are there, are there other eye diseases that, you know, uveitis makes sense. It's an inflammatory disease. We have all these models and all this evidence to support uh, inflammation. But does macular degeneration, could, could that also be attributed to uveitis? Or I mean to uh, the microbiome. And over the last 15 years, we found that macular degeneration has an inflammatory component. So there's probably this element of inflammation that's prolonging or causing a worsening of macular degeneration. Well, when we looked at the microbiome from patients with macular degeneration, we found that there was increases in some species and decreases in others. So this is a very familiar story from what I've told you about the other diseases. Um, but what was interesting was that ARIDS vitamins, which are, is the only thing that we know to slow progression of the disease, right? Those vitamins actually influence the activity of some, we don't actually know how ARIDS works. We don't know how those vitamins specifically slow the progression of disease. What we found was that those vitamins were actually having an influence on some of those bacteria in the gut. And so the question is, is that how these vitamins are working? Um, now, so this is a great photo of a very fat mouse um, next to a very skinny one. And we know that high fat diets, so especially monounsaturated fats, have an incre people that have those diets have an increased rate of macular degeneration, okay? So when you go home, check your refrigerator, right? And so what they did was they fed these mice high fat diets and they, they, they found that, they, and then they looked at their microbiome and they found that, okay, they're, they're different. And then they took the skinny mice and even without feeding them more, put that microbiome in there and those mice developed macular degeneration. Okay, so again, it's probably not the high fat in and of itself, but how it influences the microbiome that results in worsening of macular degeneration in these models. Diabetes, similarly, it's thought that, uh, ch that certain bacteria influence the development of diabetes, insulin resistance, so whether people are more or less responsive to the insulin in their bodies. When you become almost, when you become less insulin responsive, then your blood sugar starts to go up and then people develop diabetes. Well, we found that that occurs. Now, the other thing is that there are drugs, there are, uh, there are diabetic drugs that we're still not sure exactly how they work completely. And one of those drugs is a drug called metformin. Everybody's heard of that. So what they found is that people that took metformin had a very specific microbiome. And it's totally independent of whether their blood sugars were controlled or not. So the next question is, well, is that the way that this drug is exerting its effects, right? Is that the way that it's helping to reduce the, the level of diabetic retinopathy? And it's an open-ended question. It's being researched right now, but we're not sure. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll talk about here is glaucoma. And one of my colleagues back in New York um, actually looked at this and said, well, let's take mouthwash specimens from a bunch of patients with glaucoma and let's see what it looks like. Well, they found that the glaucoma seems to be responsive or seems to be more sensitive to local um, changes in the microbiome. So the closest one is either the eye or the mouth. Well, they looked at the mouth and they found that there is a definite difference there. Again, they used a mouse model and they took bacteria and they gave these mice bacteria, and what they found was that when they had those particular bacteria, they developed glaucoma, or their optic nerves actually degenerated much faster. When they treated them with antibiotics, they were actually able to prevent that from occurring. So again, there's, there's evidence for this influence of different, bacterial, uh, different bacteria, and in different areas of your body, 
to influence eye disease. And I think this is gonna be a really exciting and very promising area of, of research over the next 10 to 20 years uh, when we can finally characterize it and then start acting on, on that to reduce some of these diseases. It may be that, um, I th and, and a lot of people will say this, that I think that what's gonna happen in the next 10 years is that you're probably gonna walk into your doctor's office and when you get your normal blood panel, they're also gonna get a stool sample and they'll run it and characterize your whole microbiome and then use that in addition to sort of treat you. Um, and so this was sort of just a brief slide about what our study, or what one of my uh, studies is doing, which is to look at the microbiome, both in the mouth as well as uh, the gut, for patients with uveitis. That's that autoimmune disease of the eye. And the, the other thing is that we want to take blood. And you might say, well, why, why do that? Just because you know who's there doesn't mean you know who's doing what, right? So if you have a crowd of people and there are crimes being committed, you can't tell just by looking at the crowd who's doing it. Well, if you take blood, what you can do is something called metabolomics. So you can look at molecules that are being sent back and forth between the gut and other parts of the body and see what's causing it or what cell signals are causing the inflammation. And so that's sort of the next level that we're looking at. Um, so again, these, uh, the microbiome may play a role uh, and I think almost certainly it does in uveitis. It probably plays a role in some of these other um, diseases as well. And, you know, I think we're going to be able to manipulate this going forward, whether that is by prebiotics, probiotics, or fecal transplants. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to play out yet, but I do think that that is going to be a, a strong modality for us to treat disease and to keep people healthy over the next, you know, 20 years. Okay. But... I want to thank you very much for oops, the opportunity and get this finished on time. So if you have questions, um, Dr. Kedar would be happy to respond to them and, and we'll try to repeat the questions. Oh, do you want me to do that? Uh, no, I can repeat okay. them. Yeah. I'll, uh, now that you've reminded me, I'll remember. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's, I, oh, sorry, so let me, let me, sorry, so I, I told them I would repeat the questions and then I forgot again. Um, so I, the, the question was whether there it was that, uh, she had read that there was some connection between taking antidepressants and uh, changes in the microbiome. And yes, there, there probably are changes that occur with a lot of different drugs and not just antidepressants, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's most likely the case, yeah. No, we, yeah, we certainly can. I think that the, a lot of autoimmune disease has a similar pathway and a similar process by which they, they occur, but I don't think we can generalize to, to all of them because each one has a slightly different way that it expresses itself. Um, yeah. Yes. Other than the general term of having more fiber may help. Yes. Yeah, I, um, you know, there are a lot of, there, so there are a lot of things that are um, put out there, and I think there is some evidence to support that, but nothing's been put through a really rigorous trial. So the, so the question, sorry, the question was whether there are other things that um, I could recommend nutritionally to sort of help promote a, a healthy gut, essentially, right? And yeah, I think that there's, there, there are things, people have talked about curcumin, right, sort of derivative of turmeric. Um, which has, I think, some promise as an antioxidant that may actually be helpful, but none of the, none of the studies has been, for curcumin have been very rigorous. And so just as a physician, I don't like to recommend things unless we have some firm evidence behind them because otherwise who knows what we're, what we're doing. But the, the fiber, definitely, curcumin possibly. And then reducing, I think, you know, what we're talking about now is, uh, You've heard of glycemic index. People talk about that. You go and you go buy a loaf of bread, and it's a low glycemic index bread. So, 
in, in that picture I showed you with the mice, where one was fat and one was thin, one, one, there are similar experiments where they look at not only high-fat diets, but high glycemic index diets, and they have very similar patterns. So I think all the things that you know, everybody's been telling us for a number of years now, which is you know, reduce your sugar intake, probably you know, reduce your, your monounsaturated fats, uh, re don't have a high-fat diet you know, in, with that specifically. I think that's all probably a, a reasonable approach at this point. Yes. Um, I just, yeah, I was wondering if I had understood that right on reducing monounsaturated fats. Yeah. I thought those were the ones that were supposed to be heart healthy. Yeah, I know. So that's, yeah, so it was, it's specifically with these, these conditions with macular degeneration. So it's, it, it may be beneficial in one area and not so beneficial in another. Yes. Oh, sorry. Dr. Vignette, fecal transplantation. Yes. Yeah. But once the transplantation is done, uh, do the microbes reside in the colon or do they migrate throughout the digestive tract? Yeah, so, so, I, so at least as I, as I understand it, again, I'm not, uh, take it with a grain of salt. So the question was with the fecal transplant, do, once they're in the colon, do they migrate elsewhere or do they stay in that area? And, um, you know, again, take it with a grain of salt, I'm not a gastroenterologist, but from my understanding from the studies is that when, they, when they've been doing it, they kind of will do a colonoscopy and they'll deposit it right in that area. As I was mentioning before, the microbiome is very specific for different regions. And so what happens is a lot of times you can repopulate that area, but it doesn't seem to spread to other areas because there are either other environmental factors within different parts of the intestine or other bacteria that inhibit the spread there. Did you have a, did you have a question? Yeah, so the question was that, you know, I'd said that probably identification of, uh, the question was whether, what do I think of these other, these companies that are offering kits? I think there's one under the name Smart Gut, and there's a few other uh, companies that are putting this out there. Um, and, and what do I think of them in the context of that we, I, just identifying the bacteria may not be enough, that we need to understand what they're doing. And so that that is, I don't know how valuable it is at this point, because we don't have enough data yet to know what's healthy and what's not healthy. And there's what's good for you may not be what's good for the person sitting next to you. Um, and that still has to be established. Uh, you know, the companies are, are putting themselves out there, sort of like the 23andMe and all the genetic testing as well. I mean, we don't, they can provide you with the information. You know, we have the technology to sequence things, but we don't always know what it means. So it's a lot of information, not sure what to do with it. So at present, I don't really encourage people to do it because we don't know you know, there's nothing to, there's no actionable evidence, so we don't know what to do for that. Is there? Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, um, is there any connection between uveitis and medications that are given to people with uveitis? Like, is there any connection Yes, so, so there is, there's actually strong clinical evidence for, um, uh, for medications that are used to treat osteoporosis and, um, and uveitis and eye inflammation. So it's not just uveitis, but scleritis, similar to the patient that I showed you. Um, and so we're, it doesn't occur in the majority of patients. It's probably a minority of patients that are taking these drugs that develop eye inflammation. But in patients, at least what I found is that in patients that are on these drugs that develop eye inflammation and we're not able to identify another cause, a lot of times I'll take the patient off of those drugs and to see whether the inflammation resolves. Sometimes you don't need to. You can just treat locally with eye drops for a period of a month or six weeks and then take them off and everything's okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, all right, yes. Does exercise affect our Yes, it does. And it's, there's, there's a, a lot, there's um, a different difference and even the type of exercise. So if you're, aerobic exercise, if you're running a lot, the runner's microbiome is different from people that like just weight lift. And so yeah, there's a, it definitely does. And most likely in a, in a 
positive, I can only think that it would be in a positive fashion. <laughs> no, you, 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 you need both. You need both. But, but the, the current thinking is that you probably only need about an hour of strength training to, for longevity. Yeah, a week. So yeah, that's good. I, I was actually thinking about that as, so she wanted to know which osteoporosis drugs specifically, and I'm totally blanking on the drugs at the well, moment. But. Yeah, so Fosamax was one of the one of the agents, and all the and all yeah, and all the category of drugs that were similar to Fosamax. But like Boniva was another one that was like Asian. Uh, so far, I don't know specifically if there's been uh, any. Um, uh, occurrence of uveitis or inf ocular inflammation in patients that are on Avista, but um, Fosamax for sure had patients. Is reclass, reclass is a little bit different. It works a little bit differently, and so I think so far I haven't seen any patients with reclass. Yeah. Sorry, was there another? Yes. Do you feel like there's sufficient Yeah. Sure. Well, well. Look, I mean, there's there's uh, there's in, there's obviously enough incentive in Silicon Valley for this company, Smart Gut, to go forward and sequence this sort of thing. Um, yeah, there. I think most of the the money that we're seeing is coming from government funding, so from National Institutes of Health um, and projects that way. In fact, some of the grants that we've been doing, or from the state. So. Uh, the, the grant that I have for this is coming from a microbiome initiative that California is running and all the University of California is running. Um, I think as we get, as with anything, as we get more data and as we learn more about it, there's going to be more interest in funding that. But there's, um, you know, there's genetics companies and I, I do think that eventually there will be a, um, you know, people are going to want to sell you prebiotics, right? People are want to sell you probiotics. So, I think there will be there will be a, an influx of cash at some point, but I think the the evidence is too kind of out there in the ether that we don't people don't want to invest yet. Yeah. Yes. Can you say that the fiber that you get from the fruits and vegetables uh -huh. would be more your recommendation over fiber that you get in a jar over the counter? That's that's a good question. I. I don't know if I have the answer to that. The, my own personal bias is always for natural foods and just to take, get it straight from the source. Um, but I don't know for a fact that it's that much different. I don't, you know, that the fiber is that much different. That you get a Metamucil, for instance. I don't know if that's that much different than the ones you're getting out of an apple. So, yes. Sorry, one Please. By the very nature of yogurt, mm -hmm. That or they talk about like like now the big trendy thing is kombucha tea, right? So it's a fermented tea. We don't know, yeah, regardless of how your feelings on, so the question was whether or not yogurt could be a, a, a probiotic. So, um, you know, I think regardless of your feelings on how those things taste, but um, we don't, there seems to be no evidence yet that they work. So even yogurt as a probiotic there doesn't seem to be strong evidence that they're working in humans, and, and it may be, as I said before, that we just haven't designed the trials appropriately to detect those differences. Um, they have, there was an interesting study that was done a while ago with um, mice in, on a behavioral study, and they found that certain mice that were, had particular microbiome uh, characteristics were more anxious, and they had lower cognition, like they just didn't think as well, and the, 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 what they were doing was they were transplanting specific bacteria. They were taking something called lactobacillus, which comes from you know, uh, milk products. And they actually found that that transformed it. It made, the, it made them less anxious. And there is, there is some evidence for that in babies that have colic, right? So like 20, I think it's 20% of babies get colic. So very, they're, they're crying all the time. You can't, not inconsolable. Well, they actually sell probiotic drops that you can give the baby that have lactobacillus in them that are supposed to sort of calm the baby down and relieve colic. And it works to a certain extent. So I do think that there's, that is the way that things are going to go, but we don't have much evidence to support it just yet. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that probably depends largely on how you how you uh, 
culture the yogurt, right? So if you're going through a large in industrial yogurt, they're probably using the same one every time. If it's something that's homegrown, maybe you're using something different. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so stress is one of those things, and we've, I've tried to study it with uveitis as well. It's one of those things that's very hard to study because it's hard, you know, what's stressful to you is different to the other person, and the questionnaires are, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but there is, I'll tell you just anecdotally from patients, so the question is whether stress could, and diet and supplementation influenced macular degeneration. So I'll just tell you anecdotally I found that like patients with uveitis, inflammation in the eye, a lot of them will complain about a stressful event just prior to development of inflammation in the eye. With macular degeneration, I think it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit harder to quantify because it tends to be a progressive disease over time rather than an episodic inflammation. And so it's hard to know, well, is it stress at, you know, in January versus stress in December and, you know, what's causing that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the issue is that most now, because we have these treatments, so for, there are two types of macular degeneration. One is considered, one's called wet, one's called dry. Wet has blood vessels that grow underneath the retina. And that previously was, was a leading cause of blindness. But over the last uh, several decades, we've developed injectable drugs that can actually treat those blood vessels and people actually do very well. Now it's the dry form that we don't really have very much to treat that, but the vitamins are there. And so what happens is if you have macular degeneration and you're going to the doctor, you're usually getting treated with one or the other. So it's hard to know whether is it stabilizing because of what we're doing or because of these other sort of more um, holistic interventions, right? So changing your diet or, or decreasing your stress, that sort of thing. So we'd really, I don't think there's a, there are good studies, at least none that I know of, there are not good studies to show that differentiation just yet. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the ARIDS vitamins. Mm -hmm. so, so ARIDS is age-related eye disease study, and this was a trial that was done by the National Institutes of Health. Um, so it was a well-completed study, and what they found was that for certain types of macular degeneration, not everybody, but some types of macular degeneration, taking these vitamins reduced the chance of blind, the progression to blindness by, by 40 to 50 percent. So, it's, a, so it's, a, it's actually a formulation including vitamin E and A, and there's, and there's certain um, levels, right? So certain numbers. But it's, it's, it's not a proprietary thing. And the, the NIH is not selling this in the supermarket. So if you go to the supermarket and it says ARIDS, it'll say on the bottle, ARIDS formulation, and it's, there are a lot of different, Costco makes theirs, Bausch & Lomb has another one, they're all good. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> so I'll repeat that just because it was a very good plan words. But she's asking what my gut gut stink was. Um, I think that. Uh, if I was to recommend, and again, uh, please, this is sort of off the record, I guess. Um, I actually would really recommend a vegan or vegetarian diet, uh, decreasing animal protein, um, and also uh, increasing fiber and lots of fruits and vegetables, I think. And having, so I guess from with Michael Pollan, Pollan, the uh, food writer. So he had this sort of pyramid, and his, his maxim was like, you know, eat, eat, ever eat things that are like natural and things that are mostly fruits and, and like eat mostly fruits and vegetables. And I actually think like his directive is usually what I'll I'll point to with my relatives. Yeah. As a vegan. Yeah. What about homemade kombucha? <laughs> so. The difficulty is, again, we don't know. So what about homemade kombucha? So again, kombucha is a fermented tea. It has supposedly a lot of probiotics in it. And again, I, I, you know, I'm not a nutritionist, but um, I would say that we don't have sufficient evidence to support taking probiotics that kombucha does anything. 
there is some, there are some case reports or some evidence that people are getting sick from kombucha because of, because it's homemade at home and you don't know exactly what's there. But that being said, there are tons of people that do it and they're not getting sick. Whether it's helping you, I can't tell, but most of the time it's not gonna hurt you, so it's probably fine. Yeah, did you have a question? Mm-hmm. And so if you have had part of your coal is removed, then you obviously have less real estate and you no longer have certain locations. Right. So you're probably potentially missing not only some function, but you're also missing some microbiota that probably wouldn't thrive someplace else. Yeah. So the question was, uh, in some diseases, we end up resecting or taking out parts of the colon that are diseased or you know, causing an issue. And the question was whether in patients like that where you've taken this colon out, if you don't have that area, that real estate for a particular type of bacteria, is that then decrease functioning or have other effects? And I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what happens when, you know, when you do resect the colon, I, I don't know whether those bacteria then shift to another part, whether there's an accommodative uh, response there or whether those are just eliminated or maybe you do get you know some of those bacteria arise in other parts of the body that perform the same function so I, I don't have a good answer for you I'm sorry do they also live in the small intestine or oh yeah everywhere everywhere yeah yeah they're all over but 95 percent of your microbiome is in your gut so large yeah most of the time it's col it's the colon um, I think we have uh, time for just one last question. Oh, I think you had your question. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, both. Both, yeah. I think fi fiber is fiber. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, so sorry, the question was, when I was talking about fiber, is it, is it fruits and vegetables or grains? And the truth is, I think it doesn't matter as long as you, probably you want a healthy bit of everything in there. Thank you very much for coming out. I'll answer any other questions up front. Thank you, Dr. Kadar. And he has agreed to stay and answer some questions. So, of course, the library closes at 9. That's the one caveat. He might like to get home to his family sooner than that. But thank you for coming.